to you playing for people. And, you know, his experience was nearly all coffee house, you know, up yeah. till he got to Nashville. And, you know, so it was all about writing a song when he started writing them and playing them for audiences. And then he got there and all of a sudden he was writing songs and people were saying, oh, you got it. Somebody's got it on hold and they might record it. I think he always found that experience frustrating to the day that he died when it got right down to it you know, being in that position there he was kind of all about going out and playing yeah well you know you would know that steve that you know that thing about he would say you know songs aren't finished until you play them in front of an audience and which is really true but we would have gone you know some of these songs aren't finished until we play them for Susanna. Susanna. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Which oh. when you got you got her blessing, then it's like I could look somebody in the eye and sing a song. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And which is the, the, a lot of that stuff's in this record that you've made, you know, the, just the whole idea of that and that moment in time. I guess we're, we're all making these records. I made a record that was just about the musical moment when I made the decision to move from Texas when it looked like the coolest thing in the world was happening there and I decided to, to move to Nashville. And there's a lot of reasons for that, you know. It's, I've always said it's. Also, also, the weather was too good. The girls were too pretty, and the dope is too cheap. And I never get anything done there, so I went to Nashville. <laughs> so it's one of the, got yeah. to know it was raining all the time, and people were you know like sitting around in a room trying to. We had no place to play. There was two places: Bishop's Pub and the Villager, pretty much it. And then a writer's night at the Exit Inn. That if you knew somebody, you could get on maybe once or twice a year. Yeah, the whole that, thing was to get a slot at the Exit Inn. Yeah. You know, I got mine finally because guy just muscled me. In, you know, it was my first. <laughs> I didn't get mine game. until I came through town with Emmy Lou. Really? <laughs> yeah. Holy shit! <laughs> and I played the gig under protest. <laughs> yeah, did you? Yeah, he could be hard to argue with. No, so man. You know what? It's like back then I was a, I used a thumb pick. You yeah. know, over the years writing songs, I just didn't put the thumb pick on. I just started playing with my fingers. Right. But. Uh, you know the the hot band was uh, you know was Emory Gordy and uh, James Burton and and Glenn Harden were playing with Elvis then and then playing with Emmy's band and right. so we had we Emmy was booked at the Exit Inn and Elvis had a gig that night so we had to scrap together a band so Emmy said well Rodney you're gonna have to play bass. <laughs> And I said, with a I was thumb there. pick? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So I played that show with a, with a thumb pick. And, you know, basically, I, you know, I played all the songs like I was playing rhythm guitar on a bass, you know, right. just drumming it. Punk rock bass. And then, there you, you know, this, yeah. this is, you know, Nashville. So we, you had to walk through the crowd, you know, to get backstage. I don't, was there even a backstage? I don't remember. Well, th there was a little house in the back. You could walk either yeah, right. through the front or you could go through the kitchen out yeah, the back door right. and there was a little house out in the back of a little gravel parking lot. Was but it backstage at the exit? There was a, somebody standing in the doorway and you know as I passed and he said, hey man, you play pretty good, but you need to work on your shuffles. <laughs> and I said, man, I'm a folk guitar player with this thumb pick. <laughs> I deserve more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, 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 and they, that band played shuffles, no, no doubt about it. It was a pretty amazing band to be a part of, you know, the hot band, because yeah. you were headed out to be a member of that band, you know, just as I got there. And, you know, the two records that people were listening to when I got there to live, I came in November of... 74 and then in the 75 two records came out emmy's first record well for, for the first major label record pieces of the sky and um and blood on the tracks and those were the two records and that that dylan record coming along when it did was sort of a huge deal i think a lot of us this group of post christopherson you know therefore post bob dylan songwriters in nashville we probably are, we're getting told that we're doing everything wrong and that we need to change the way we're going to do things if we're going to be successful. And we wanted to be successful. You know, we didn't want to have to get jobs. So it was, uh, it was becoming crucial. And uh, it would be like, but I think it just sort of Dylan coming out with a record that fucking strong, we all kind of remembered, oh, yeah, this is, this is why we do this. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, that's a big deal, that record. Yeah, you know, and also, you know, hearing Towns play, you know, Poncho and Lefty the first time upstairs at uh, Amy, Amy Martin's place. Remember oh, yeah, that yeah, yeah, carriage yeah. house she had? Um, yeah, I remember I forgot the first place. time I heard Towns play Poncho and Lefty, it was up there. You know, and he he would always come through Nashville, you know, and his thing, he'd be kicking heroin, you know, as as That's why Susanna used to say, uh, he's pulling up. 
Yeah. Then when he, and everybody would wait around in the yard in lawn chairs, you know, and you know, like a vigil waiting for towns, for towns to, to get up, for, wait for him to get up and come down and play some new song, you know. And, and yeah. I'll tell you what, probably a lot of great ideas for songs came about while you know people were you know songwriters were. I remember Dave Loggins and, and we would all sit around out there and wait for towns to come down and have discussions and play little pieces of songs and, and you know, I, I think some really good songs were born out of waiting on towns to yeah, come down. Yeah, that, that's the way, I mean, when I was in Houston, like during most of the period that, that Rodney's talking about, and it, it, essentially there were people in Colorado and people in Houston and people in Nashville that spent two-thirds of their lives waiting for towns to come back around from one of these places that he in his migratory path because he literally did not live anywhere for eight years and he had a half interest in a horse and he used to pick him up and ride him across the mountain to crested you know from mm -hmm. to crested butte from aspen bronco newcomb's family had that stable there yeah. and he just that that, I, that was the i was 17 that was the coolest thing i had ever heard of and i'm 63 and I still think it's the coolest thing I've ever heard of and it's you know it, you know that whole deal he was just didn't that was what I what happened for with me how I ended up in Nashville I followed towns around Texas for but then he would disappear and and I would I finally figured out that I he wasn't ever gonna lie to anywhere and I could see him several places around the planet so I went on to Nashville and well and I met God it, immediately that, Makes me think of something Bobby Bear said about George Jones. You know, he said, now George Jones goes around, you know, plays a gig, and, uh, and there's a bunch of drunks that want to get drunk with George that night. And then they all go home and sleep it off, and George had to go to the next town, and it was a fresh set of drunks that want to get drunk with George Jones. <laughs> and he said, yeah, George didn't have a chance, you know. Yeah, but, a lot but, of being itinerant Steve, is not wearing out your welcome. Steve, anymore. I got a question that, I, that you know what, I've, I've told, this is based on a story that Guy told me, and I've always wanted to ask you about, and so is, since how we're in public. Okay, this will be good. Yeah. Uh, because the main reason I never asked you about it, because I didn't really know if it was true, and I thought, if it's not true, I want to go on believing it's true, but at the same time, I want to know if it is true sure and this is from guy he said to me he said man he said steve was when towns had that farm down around franklin he said and and guy told me you told this story that uh you had a new pistol a new six-year with a a spinner you know what do you call it the, when you a say, revolver yeah so revolver, a revolver revolver you she said, was, he said I had a new pistol? Yeah, you tracking okay. this story yet? Keep going, and, okay. and I, I know the story, and, 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 I, and this so story gets told a lot, and nobody was there but me in town. So, but, 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 yeah. It's like, and this is, this is so, well, you get the final say, but this is how it was told to me. You had a new pistol, and you were showing it to towns, and you kept saying, man, man, this, isn't that a fine pistol? This is, and town said to you, according to Guy, uh, see, what do you know about pistols? whatever you told him that you knew about pistols and he said I'll show you what I know about pistols he opened up the revolver took out five bullets put one back in spun it and clicked it yeah and he said he said you know what else I knew about pistols spun it again clicked again here it is man is that a true story um what's not true about it is it was Towns's pistol and um <laughs> Okay. That's just for starters. And that's okay. just what God, Towns had, and, and Guy probably knew this at one point, but it's really easy. He could have forgotten it. Towns had a 357 Magnum Ruger revol single action revolver. He had, had, he had it when I met him in 1972. Um, he, he used to carry it with him when he rode across. He, had, he was a, being a cowboy, he had to have a six shooter. And I don't know where he got it, but he had that. And he also had a, mu a muzzle-loading rifle that he had built from a kit. Now, he would given that to me, and I owned it by the time the story that you're talking about happens. When Towns got, you know, lost his horse and, and quit going to Crested Butte, and he got banned from Crested Butte, and he settled in Clarksville, and, and which is this ritzy neighborhood in Austin now, and it was a ghetto then. Yeah. And, and he was there for a while. And that's where you see him if you've seen Heartworn Highways when he gives the guided tour of the little strip of trailers that he lived in. And he, um, 
Then finally, he came on to Nashville and he needed a place to live. I had a cabin that I rented for about 50 bucks a month and I was, had gone through a divorce and was with the craziest girl in Tennessee and we got married in the, the Metro Airport bar and took off to Mexico and gave Towns a trailer. And um, Of course you did. So Towns, <laughs> I retained driveway rights and to the trailer. So when I'd come back, to, I'd commute from San Miguel and to Nashville to pitch songs, which was a long commute, but it made sense in my life at the time. And I'd come back and I'd park in the driveway and I'd hang out. Now I'd become a little bit of a gun nut and I, you know, I didn't have any money, but I bought a few guns here and there and I had, I had maybe a bolt action rifle and a lever, Towns had a lever action rifle, that pistol, and I had his old muzzle loader, but he had a, he had a, he had a, a Marlin, you know, uh, Yeah, but Marlin did rifle. he click? Yes, <laughs> he did, but, but the way it came down is, is it's been told as him giving me a lecture about guns. I'd just written The Devil's Right Hand, and that's what freaked him out. I had a song about guns, so he thought maybe I was going over the edge. But he, uh, I'm always telling people that people say that's a gun control song, but when I wrote it, I had a whole trailer full of fucking guns. But um, <laughs> he walked in with his gun, and whether it was meant to be a parable or not, I don't know. But I was in the trailer. I was in his cabin. He walks in. And he gets the pistol out, and he lays it down for a second. I said, oh, you still got that Ruger? And he said, he goes, yeah. And he goes, and I said, can I see it? And he said, sure. And so I looked at it, I said, I said, well, fuck, it's loaded. And I unloaded it. And um, he goes, put the shells back in it, man. Put them back in. And I, you know, I started to reload the gun. And it was against my, I, my better judgment. <laughs> and... I, I start handing it back to him and he takes it and he just shucks all of the shells out of it at one time, just chuck, 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 cowboy thing. He did it pretty well, it was pretty good because the, the cylinder doesn't come out. You have to do them one at a time. And then he picked one up. He didn't say a word, he just put it in it. He goes, you know, man, things are, I'm just, I'm just, you know, things are getting really hard and it's, you know, it's probably about time for me to move on anyway. And he spun the fucking cylinder and he put it to his head and he pulled the trigger. And I was like, okay, what do I do now? And I'm yeah. saying, he's closer to me than you, but not quite close enough for me. And I'm just trying to figure out what I'm you thinking you're next? <laughs> I'm, no, I'm thinking, I'm thinking that I'm going to get charged with it if I try to get the gun and it goes off. That's what I'm thinking. I'm trying to keep from hurting anybody. And, and I, I, I get, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to reach for it. And he does it. He spins it a second time. And... He did spin it again. It would have been worse if he'd pulled the trigger without spinning it. Oh. Yeah, that's way lower odds. But it, he, 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 like, he pulled it again. And, and the, the clack was the loudest fucking thing you've ever heard in your life. And then he sort of dropped it down and started to run his mouth about something again. And I got him by the wrist, and I took the gun away from him, and I unloaded it, and I kicked his ass. And then, All right. and then, All right. then Cindy came home. And I'd gone back down to my trailer, and Cindy came home and kicked my ass because I kicked Towns' ass. She kept his throat. Could you let him live? She was like, she just, she would, Towns lied to her, told her that I was up there playing with the gun, and well, didn't, she left out the whole Russian roulette thing. Just said I kicked his ass, and that was, left out the other part of it. Thank you for telling me that story. So it's essentially true, but it wasn't my gun. Yeah. Whoa. Okay. Cool. So now this is your radio show. Um, do you have another one in you? Before, yeah. Something else you want to play yeah, before? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, we talk about Susanna. I wrote this song. When Susanna died, I was, you know, Susanna, her agoraphobia just, you know, went warp speed on steroids after Towns died. Literally, you could go back to that night we were on the Austin City Limits. Right. From that point on, she was done, and... I'd go visit her, and you know, I would I would sit in my chair up out in the outer room there from her bedroom. She'd lie in her bed, and I said, I would sit there where I could see her, and I say, if you want to talk to me, you're going to have to get out of that bed and come in here and sit down and talk to me. And she'd give me that look like, I'll wear you down, buddy. And, and sure enough, I'd wind up dragging the chair in there and sitting and talking to her. Yeah. But I loved her, and I was really angry when she passed away. I was angry at you know that she quit and uh, so I want you know I knew I would write a song and and I about her or for her because of it and I thought about 
you know, some pretty picture, but that wasn't the truth about how I loved her and how I felt. So I wrote this. I think the thing Whoa. that we were talking about, about about Susanna was like, we learned a lot about songwriting from Guy and Towns and, and all those people, but I think all of us, including Guy himself, learned to carry ourselves as artists from Susanna, you know, and that's which is essential. She was, and sometimes I think that looking back at it, of course, hindsight is more than 2020 sometimes, is that maybe 
if she had just had, she started painting a little bit just before she got too sick to do anything, but if she kept painting all that time, I think she would have been better off, because I always felt like messing around, she wrote really great songs and had hits when we didn't, and then, you know, but she was slumming, because a painter's like, that's a really, really rare thing, and she was really a great painter, I love, I love yeah. her paintings, but um, let me see, uh, can we get the guitar up, my guitar? Um, hmm. Oh, that's the wrong one. Sorry. Hate brain damage. So I've hit that Mando switch, and we're going to have to deal with that when the time comes up. Uh, I'm going to do this because uh, this is on my last record. I thought Guy would go when Susanna did, which wasn't thinking clearly, but he outlived her by quite a spell because it's sort of disconnected. And I think, um, but, um, you know, when, uh, when, Guy, um, he's too stubborn, you know, for his own good and too, <laughs> too tough for his own good sometimes. And um, he was sick a long time. Too mean and, for my yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, he could be mean. And, um, but when Guy finally passed away, we had a wake in, in, um, in Nashville. And it was uh, the last thing that my great teacher said to me was I, went, I visited him in the hospital. And, and he was, uh, I'd been going home a little bit more often. And, and um you know, I'd stop by on the way to the airport. So a lot of people thought it'd be nice to get him some barbecue. And it was like, you know, he said, I went and just, I, I didn't expect to get anything to eat. I was just on my way to the airport. But everybody was sort of standing around. I think he was playing possum because he was tired of talking to people. And I walked over to the bed and I said, I said, guy, how was that barbecue? And he said, pork. Because <laughs> guy was, he was from right. Texas and he was in Tennessee 40 some odd years and he never accepted pork as proper barbecue. So <laughs> the, the last thing that my teacher said to me was pork. And then I went home and a few nights later uh, I got a call from Rodney and he said he didn't think he was going to get through the night. And then the next morning I got a text that just said gone. And went back to Tennessee and we had a wake, and a, there were 50 or 60 people there, and all these kids had been writing songs with that I'd never met, and it kept him writing. We have some songs that we wouldn't have otherwise, and, and I learned something from that, and I've been going there and writing with some of these guys since then. Uh, and then uh, when it was all over, we cried, and we sang some songs, and when it was over with me, Rod, and Sean Camp, guy's Berlin. girlfriend, Don, Berlin. yeah, Berlin Thompson, and, uh, McGuire. and Jim McGuire, and uh, Tamara Saviano. And we got on a tour bus and we took guys ashes to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And we got there the next evening at sunset, most beautiful land-based sunset I've ever seen. I give Guy full credit for it. And then Lyle Lovett flew in and Robert Earl Keen and uh, Joe Ely, em Emmy Lou Harris, Jack Ingram. And uh, we sang some more songs and we cried some more. And when I got home, I made this up.
don't you cry He'll find you by and by Just like he did before And forever it's just goodbye Till it come my time I won't have to travel blind Taught me everything I know Goodbye Michelangelo Pretty song, good Thanks. song. You know what? We should, uh, uh, for your audience, we should talk a little about. Yeah, we saw the Beatles. Yeah, the, the same same show. Yeah, we have all these sort of parallels that we discover. You know, we you know I, I'd been to Houston before I got here. We have totally different experiences of Telephone Road, and both have songs about it. And uh, but they're both real, just happened at different points in time. Yeah. Um, but we discovered. I went to see the Beatles when I was, um, well, 10. And I didn't, you know, ch chronology gets a little fuzzy after a while, and um, especially in certain decades. And I was, um, I just, um, you know, I, I don't know why it came up. I think, I think I knew that you'd seen the Beatles. I think I'd heard you say that. And, I, and then it just occurred to me we had to have seen the same show. You know what's key about, what, excuse me for interrupting you, Steve, but what you're, you're saying we saw the Beatles, which is very much what happened. Cause, exactly. Because we didn't hear. We didn't hear anything. <laughs> that's, that's true. It's absolutely. We knew. We knew what those records. We knew those records, like, like they were part of us. By yeah. the time we saw yeah, that, we knew those records like the back of our hand. And I always say that, yeah, we saw. I say we because we're telling the story, but you know, yeah, I saw the Beatles, uh, and I couldn't hear. A, a note or a word they sang, but I knew, uh, but I heard every song anyway. Right, right. Yeah, which was a pretty magical thing. What we discovered is that there were two shows. The Beatles only played Houston. This is when it occurred to me that after being a little bit of a nerd about it for a while and, and reading all this stuff on the internet about Beatles shows, I thought maybe the Beatles had played Houston more than once, but they hadn't. It was only one time. And that's when it occurred to me, and that's why I asked you that day, because... I was at the I was at the Houston afternoon show. There were there were always an afternoon and an evening show in larger cities that could support the tickets, and it wasn't. Even, now I was only ten, but I wasn't. There were a lot of people my age in ten, eleven, twelve in, on the at the at the afternoon show, especially because my I came over on on the bus by myself, and my because my aunt bought the tickets, and me and my cousin, who's just a few months young, older than I am. Uh, we went to the show, and my aunt drops us off at the Coliseum and picked us up after the show. And I was 10, she was 11. That's a good aunt. Yeah, yeah, she was great. She bought the tickets. I think they were, I think they were $4. She understood you. Yeah, 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 she did. She did. She knew it was important and that I should see it. She was the cool aunt, you know. She was, she was yeah. definitely that. But we, were, we discovered that Rodney thought he saw him in 64, and I said, no, I think they only played there in 65 because I nerded out, like I said. And uh, we discovered we were not only saw the Beatles, but we were at the same show. And yeah. it, was, uh, like, it was like being inside of a jet engine. You didn't really hear any music at all. It was like, it was, it was, it was pretty. Yeah, uh, my, my memory of it, and I think one of the, you know, I wanted to, I, I'm pretty sure I was already thinking I wanted to be a musician. I certainly wasn't thinking about I was going to be a songwriter, but something happened that where we were sitting up, you know, in the uh, bleacher side along the side, and you could see the audience. You see the stage. We're pretty close. Um, and McCartney came out and did this to the crowd, right down in front of him, and it easily 400 girls fainted. <laughs> I just out. There's no hyperbole in this. I'll this is hand what over I my do. heart, flat. Over the backs of their chairs, out. <laughs> and in my little fourteen-year-old pea brain, I said, "I want me some of that." <laughs> that is what it's all about. Where we came from, if you didn't, you know, if you didn't play football, then a the guitar was kind of your only hope. It was it. <laughs> your so, only, it's a whole only different kind of girl. Defense. But it was, you know, yeah, so, yeah. You know the. Yeah, no doubt. The hoodlums would let you pass if they knew you played guitar. 
Yeah, it's it's weird. I, where where did, were you the? Did you go around with the guitar everywhere you went? Like at a pretty early Eventually. age. <laughs> yeah, I did. Well, before I was even out of out of junior. I started as a drummer. Oh, that's right. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah. Well, I was a, you know I was a drummer in my father's you know honky tonk band. Not any good at it, but trust me. As soon as you know, I discovered girls. I got a guitar where you could get yeah, up, get up closer, closer, closer to, yeah. to the girls. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, no doubt about it. So. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Houston's a, a pretty powerful thing. It's like, um, you know, I don't, um, I try to explain to people, if I, um, especially after living in New York for 13 years, if I moved back to Texas, I'd probably have to live in Houston because it really is the closest thing to a city there. And it's, um, it's bizarre. It's a bizarre place. It's like... Um, it's, it was the fastest growing city in the United States at one point. It has been a couple of different times. And, um, you know, it, it shrank a little bit for a while in the 80s, and now it's, kind of, it's growing again. Um, way darker and way scarier than where I was from in San Antonio, but I discovered when I got there that people in Houston were afraid of people from San Antonio. It's one of those well, kind of... About scary, you know, I had, you know, some of my cousins that had moved, sharecrop cousins that had moved down there, you know, they would say, yeah, we, you know, and at the time, Houston, you know, in the 60s, late 50s through probably 66, Houston was, quote unquote, the murder capital of the world. Yeah. And my new, newly minted cousins down there, they would say, yeah, we live in Houston now, man. It's, it's the murder capital of the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's like Belfast when you used to go there and go to the Europa Hotel and say, welcome to the most bombed hotel in Europe. <laughs> yeah. You know, like it was, the you know. Europa, I know yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, we're going to do... We we had a conversation about earlier about uh, Brown and Root. You know, my my father was came to really went to Texas as, as a, a laborer. You know, sharecrop farm kid with no education, and so he got hired on by Brown and Root. And and at the time, you know, this is probably in the mid '40s. He was probably making sixty five cents an hour. But by, by the time you know, he kind of moved up to helper, and then, and I remember he was making about a buck. I remember a buck thirty-eight an hour um, as a carpenter's helper, and I remember when I started as a carpenter's helper, helper in nineteen seventy-two. The first time I did it, it was still only a dollar sixty an hour was minimum wage, and that's what you got. Uh, yeah. So it didn't See, move very much for a long well, time. Well, but there was a big jump from carpenter's helper to carpenter because oh, yeah. if you were a carpenter. You would bump up to three dollars an hour, yeah. And it's like for my father, you know, three dollars an hour was finally pulling chin up over the chinning bar. Right. It's like so. So I got the idea, or you know, I don't even think there was an idea for this song. It's just you know, being my father's son, this song just kind of oozed out of me at some particular point back in the uh, probably 1975, I guess, somewhere in there. I remember hearing you and B Spears do it. Do and and um, B had got B Spears is no longer with us, but he was Willie Nelson's bass player. For he and I kind of grew up, went to different schools together. His high school was the one next to mine, and we knew each other the whole time we were growing up. And worked for Johnny Bush, then Waylon Jennings, and then Willie Nelson. And he was had that gig for a long time, except for one period where he broke out in a bad case of art <laughs> and and quit Willie Nelson to go work for Guy Clark. And discovered really quickly he couldn't afford to fly to Las Vegas to see his girlfriend anymore, and so he went back to Willie. But but during that period when he was playing for Guy, you guys came into American Studios and you put down a recording of it. I killed to know where that recording Me is. Me too. I'm, I'm, it was him playing bass and you playing guitar and the two of you singing it in harmony. Yeah. And I remember I I it from that. And on and on the Exit Zero tour. Um, there's actually a few recordings around me, Harry Stinson, and Bucky Baxter would come down to the front of the stage and do this song together. Brown and Root was the largest construction company in the world at the time that this song that is talking about. It went on to build... Um, um, there were about oil field infrastructure originally and pipelines, but then they um, built all of the infrastructure for the Vietnam War. And then later on, they were bought by a company called Halliburton, and they're still kind of doing that. Mm -hmm. 
Lord, I work my hands in wet cement for the county highway crew. I'm the middle boy from a family of ten, and poor sons of bitches we. always drank and he never said two words to me Lord it's hell when you're down and no one cares it all looks like uphill down there cause you work and you slide you smell like dirt And you know you ain't going nowhere At Brown and Root, Brown and Root gas company would cut off the heat cause when it rains you don't work which means no pay which means not much to eat there's just too many ways to get beat Room for one more? Can we go? Sure, on a song? absolutely. Take it out of here. I want. I, th I think there's a there's a fella here that asked me uh, on the the deck if I would play this song, and you're in it, Steve. <coughs> I don't know if you heard this song, but you're in it. I think I have. And there's, you know, we've been talking a lot about Nashville, early '70s. I had a dog named Banjo. And a girl named Muffin I just blew in from Texas I didn't know nothing I found my way around this town With a friend I'd made named Guy Who loved Susanna And so did I There's this run-down shack on Ackland Avenue That I shared with Skinny Dennis and a poet named of Richard Dobson Who had a novel he would never finish That's when Johnny Rodriguez and David Only and Steve Earle first came through And every other guitar bomb whose name I never knew This was old school Nashville Harlan Howard, Bob MacDill Tom T. Hall, go drink your fill and blow us all away. There was this tightrope walker who called herself the Queen of Poughkeepsie, who'd run away from the circus. This aroused about redneck gypsy Now there were towns, vans, and fans And they were prone to combustion uh, They fought like dogs in Spanish And made love in Russian Well, I wish Newberry and Buck White Could stop on by the house tonight 
Things have changed around here, you bet, but it don't seem no better yet. Well, I first met Willie Nelson with some friends at a party. I was 22 years old and he must have been pushing 40. Now there was hippies and reefers and God knows what all I was drinking pretty hard. And I played him this shitty song I wrote and puked out in the yard. Old school Nashville, Harlan Howard, Bob MacDill, Tom T. Hawk, go drink your fill and blow us all away. Rodney Crowell, live in Outlaw Country. This is Steve Earle. You've been listening to the Steve Earle Show, Hardcore Troubadour Radio in Outlaw Country. We'll see you. Hey y'all, Elizabeth Cook. Oh my God, I just found my favorite lip balm. I'm obsessed.